And uh, welcome, everybody. It's awesome to have have us all together. And uh, I must confess, confessed, confess that uh, I'm kind of overwhelmed with trying to facilitate a group of facilitators. I was telling Joan that as facilitators, when we're trying to facilitate a gathering of Course of Love students, it's like herding cats. And it seems like from last week or two weeks ago, to try to facilitate a gathering of facilitators is kind of like herding lions because everybody here is so passionate about this book and passionate about gatherings and wanting to enter dialogue. So uh, be kind to me, be patient. And, uh, and, it, and it seems like from our gathering two weeks ago that maybe a little bit of structure might be good for our time. And I guess, I guess it's kind of the corporate side of me that kicked in. And uh, so I've created some slides to uh, use during part of our time. These slides will be made available after the, after the meeting when we send out, send out the link to the video, uh, the slides will be included. Let me just uh, take a few minutes and, and share just five slides. We don't have a lot, but we came up with this title that we were talking about facilitating a course of love gatherings, the art of taking heart. This is an interactive Zoom gathering despite having some slides here. So we expect this to be interactive. And this is just trying to illustrate what I think happens in a, in a Zoom group or in a, in a course of love in-person group. That we have a bunch of people together and this illustrates, you could imagine 12 people sitting around a table, around a circular table. Interestingly, here in Santa Fe for our in-person group, we do meet around a circular table and there are often 12 of us. And so it's a large interconnected team. And sometimes it's just being overwhelmed with that, the interconnectedness of it. Because with 12 people in a gathering, there are actually 132 relationships that exist amongst those 12 people. So the Course of Love, or Course of Miracles says that the temple of the Holy Spirit is not the body, but a relationship. So there's a lot of holy temples that exist when people get together. So we can start off by saying I'm part of a large interconnected team. And as the, as the group works together more and spirit starts to wake up in the collective, we start realizing that amazing things are starting to happen. Ideas are surfacing. You know, we talk about when we enter dialogue, the unknown becomes known. And so this black and white weaving got a little color to it. The spirit's waking up. As we, as we keep diving into the spirit that lives in the collective, we really start getting overwhelmed. It's like, wow, there's so much power and inspiration and enthusiasm that exists in this web of relationship. And I really love this last picture because it's still got 12 points on it. And the image is actually what's called a God's eye. And it's created by uh, native Mexicans and native New Mexicans, Pueblo Indians, create this image and they say that that image, the weaving of the God's eye, uh, captures the invisible. And I think that's true. When we're in a group or a gathering, there's something happening in the invisible that is very real and substantial. So I really like that image of the God's eye. So the last slide I'm gonna present for now is just some suggested guidelines for our time together. The one is just to just to be aware of the spirit that it lives in the collective in this gathering we have right now. Um, be succinct when you share, and I'm not necessarily demonstrating that right now, but be mindful of, of the number of participants and just you know be to the point. And then last last time we got together in two weeks two weeks ago, there was some mention of well let's use the chat feature in Zoom or let's use the hands up feature in Zoom. And we tried that and it just got too cumbersome. So what I'd like to suggest is when you're ready to talk or when you're being called on, just unmute your microphone, raise your hand and start talking. So don't try to um, use any of the features in Zoom. 
So let me stop here and just see if there are any initial responses to the guidelines for our time together. Any, any, and you can provide those to now if you want, or we can do it via email, but what are your thoughts on how this group works together? And when you're done, say, I'm complete, I'm complete. Did I talk too much? I think they're perfect. <laughs> <laughs> they speak to me. Okay. Simple, complete. And uh, uh, Barbara, are you, can you uh -huh. hear us? Yes. Do you hear okay. me? Yes. We hear you. Yes. Beautiful. All right. Christopher, how's it coming with uh, our, can you hear us, Christopher, still? He's, He's just muted. Okay. He's unmuted now. I'm guessing that he can see us, but we just can't see him. We can't see him. Okay, wonderful. And to um, unmute, uh, access my camera, I'm using a, 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 an iPad at the moment. Can you speak up a little bit? Yes. Uh, I, I'm trying to help my speaker. Um, I haven't been able to access my camera. I'm using okay. an iPad at the moment. Can you see me now? Yeah. Okay, well, well, welcome. Thank you. So any, any, any more comments on the, the guidelines for our time together? Perfect was nice to hear. So let's begin uh, with a dialogue on the language of the heart. Facilitating is an art that speaks the language of the heart. And so we're going to go deeply deeply into the heart today. And we'll start with a meditation that'll lead us into our hearts. And this, it's going to lead us into the silence because that is one way that the language of the heart speaks through silence, through stillness. And we've experienced that. So if we can just take a moment to, uh, Drop into our hearts. You might want to close your eyes for this. And let's just feel our way. So what is silence for? In silent mists, the truth reigns. Our hearts are like an open book that can be read by feel alone. May our hearts then be our eyes guide, a friend who takes us by the hand and leads us down the paths of love. With heart and mind as one we go, silently feeling quiet's way until we come upon the truth and then in silent stillness stay, comfortable and comforted as quiet mists release love's rain. So let us come back out of the stillness. Well, keep the stillness with you after, actually. But let's come back and open our eyes and be with one another again together. So how do you feel? How do you feel is the question 
that the heart asks. Well, as somebody who lives in their mind, I can't I have a hard time answering from the heart. <laughs> but I just notice in, in, in groups that when we start off with some silence, that the depth of sharing seems to deepen and the tolerant for silence seems to increase. People are more tolerant of having some silence between the shares. So I noticed that impact on, on our gatherings. I'm complete. Thank you. We've, we've quieted our minds is what has happened. And so now we can let our hearts lead the way in the addendum for the learning in the time of Christ, it said, the task of facilitators of such meetings of open hearts is to direct the re reader away from the ego mind and back to the wholeheartedness of Christ's mind. How do you feel is a more appropriate question than what do you think? The sharing of experience is more appropriate than the sharing of interpretation. So. so as we go along here, we'll be keeping pace with the addendum, uh, learning in the time of Christ. There's much guidance for facilitators within that addendum. And it anticipated groups sharing like we are today. So, and when we share the language of the heart, we are sharing the mind and heart joined in unity. We're sharing wholeheartedness. And so this is the new language it's the new thought system that actually the mind will join in the thought system of our hearts will lead the way do we have any responses this is Catherine yes uh, before I started facilitating the group I was quite nervous because I felt so far away from everybody <laughs> But uh, I read that addendum several times, and it just really spoke to me. And every week, I've been facilitating now for 16 months, and every week, it's just, uh, it's just become a natural thing for me to allow people to to share, but if they're getting into their thinking and opinions of just lovingly say, that is so interesting. Now let's take this to your heart and would you say the same thing that you're saying right now? And the group is growing and it's not just growing in numbers, but it's growing in uh, people are transforming. It's absolutely unbelievable. Um, so what I'd like to say is that addendum for me was invaluable. And I think it's the best guidance that uh, we could ever have. And I really try to follow it to the T because it has worked so beautifully. And I, for one, love to get off on a tangent and, you know, start talking about one thing and end up talking about something else. And so it's been really, really good for me, too, to learn to stay in my heart and out of my ego mind. And it's, uh, it's just been really helpful in all areas of my life. So thank you. I'm finished. Complete. I really like that. Let's take this to your heart. Mm. Um, I don't know how if anybody else has characters they have to deal with in meetings. 
you know, that go off topic that take a lot of time and it just kind of, I mean, somebody who was, we, we, we rotate facilitation role in one of our Zoom calls. And then the last one, somebody interrupted the character, which turned out to be okay. But I really, I just really like that phrase, Catherine. Let's take this to your heart. Wow, thanks. I'm complete. And what you shared, Catherine, uh, reminds me of um, what um, Jesus has said. Uh, it says, this is the, the common language of the heart and mind joined in unity. This new language will gather people to you in much the way people gather toward beautiful music. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when we speak from our heart, it is music to others' ears. Yeah. Yes, thank you. I'm complete. So question. How does one recognize when they're, quote, in their heart? And not in their mind or in their head. So I, I know, Steve, I can just say, you know, you know, you're there when you stop asking questions like that. Um, <laughs> no, I, 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 I but, think it's a great question. But yeah, sorry. There's a, there is a, you know, a change in perception. Yeah. And how is that change recognized? And I'm not, I'm, I'm, it, it's more of a question of inquiry of the others than I know how it is for me. And there are, I'm somewhat careful at times in, in, in meetings to avoid expressing myself so as not to, let's say, direct somebody else to that same path uh, so that they can come to it on their own. And so that's kind of, you know, the, the, uh, the background to the question then. So it, it, it's not a question. It, it's kind of an open question to everybody. How do you recognize that that change. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we learn to listen to the heart. And there, there are actually calls from the heart to lead us out of our mind um, to the heart's wisdom. And we're going to discuss that today as part of our discussion of the language for the heart. So that's a perfect lead in to this discussion. We are receiving calls all the time from creation itself, from the creation um, that lives within us, that is, that is us. And I'd like to, um, there's a section in the course of love which means uh, to, it's called to answer the call of, of creation, of the truth of our being. And so as we start listening to these calls that are rising, sometimes these calls can come as, as demands that we do so, something. Sometimes they're like signs on a bus that go by. But we start paying attention to the heart and what it is saying. There's the shift. Uh, we drop out of our mind, just like we dropped into the heart, our hearts. We drop out of our mind. But let me just read you a paragraph from chapter three, Treaties One, to answer the call. Your life is already an act of creation. It was created, all of it. It exists fully realized within you. Your work here is to express it. You are far more than your life here. You created your life here in union with the one mind and one heart, in union 
in other words, with God. Everything you have ever wanted to be is. Everything you have ever thought or imagined is and is reflected in the world you see. The only difference between the life you are living and the life you want lies in your willingness to express who you are. Yes, Judy. Judy, I'm... Oh, I am. The mute. Um, thank you, John. Um, that's been my experience, is what you just read. The, the willingness, especially um, just this last week, the willingness to express what's in my heart. And sometimes... I hold back. Um, and I noticed in this recent experience, the holding back was causing sensations in my body. And I was holding back out of what I thought was kindness or, or something, you know, just. And then I, I did express, but I, that's not the first time I've noticed that. And I, I, have heard, I have certainly been sensitive throughout um, a course of love to the call to express the truth that's in me. And I'm trying to attend to that and listen to it and honor it and be more courageous about doing that. So thank you. It really spoke to me. Barbara, did you have anything? Yeah, just what Judy said is so interesting for me that she had said that because it has been my experience of holding back and feeling in, that feeling it in my body, and um, I've I've tried to be more um, aware of it, and um, when I allow myself to express. It's, it's, it's like a miracle. It's, it's wonderful. It's freeing. It's, I know I'm, I'm, I'm talking from my heart when I am able to just notice it and express it. So I agree with the, what that was just said. And it just reminded me of what was I, I was going through at that time. Thank you very much, Joan. Complete. Yeah, I've just, I've just uh, over the last while been, been embracing this idea of just being who I am. You know, it's like in this meeting. I'm a guy who does slides. That's what I do. <laughs> you know, and, you know, I'm interested in guidelines. I'm interested in structure. And, uh, but it's a balance. It's like, you know, the, a phrase I heard in a book one time was bounded instability or controlled chaos. You know, so I think, anyway, that's, I've noticed that freedom too, and that excitement of just saying, hey, you know what, some people have criticized me for certain characteristics in my life. I'm done with that. I'm going to be who I am. I'm complete. And we're so glad. <laughs> yes. And in the Course of Love says that you would not be other than who you are. And uh, I think, Catherine, you have a response. Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to say, and, and I hope I'm on track with what Steve asked, um, that I had to very early on understand that I didn't have a role of being responsible for anyone, anyone's growth or ability to change the way they learn. Uh, the way it's laid out in A Course of Love. In other words, that it wasn't to be studied and it wasn't to be intellectual, but it was to, to embrace this new way of learning directly from your heart. And I just, you know, when, when people just aren't getting it, but they want it, 
I just encourage them to keep coming back. I thank them for sharing, even though a lot of times I do, you know, interject when they're sharing and I say, wow, you know, this, this was, I'm sure that was a great book because they're talking about another book or a movie they watched or something. And I, you know, I'll say, I'll be very complimentary and then say, let's just stay with, with what we're doing here. And let's just, you know, so that we can all learn to just embrace this. And then afterwards we could, you know, stay for tea and talk about those other things. But really what I wanted to say was, I've always tried to be a coach or uh, to help people move along and, and progress and, and this. And what A Course of Love has done for me is it allows me to be who I really am. And like was just said, that's enough. Mm-hmm. I don't have to worry about what other people are feeling or getting out of it. I just am myself. I read every day. I, uh, I'm a committed facilitator. And I just focus on the joy of being there and, and of what happens each week. And I don't have any expectations of what that will be or, or what someone else's experience will be. So I don't know, Steve, if that resonates with you or not, but that's sort of what I heard. That I, I'm not careful about what I say if it's, if it's true, <laughs> you know, uh, and it's from the course then I'm very confident in, in what I say. Thanks. I'm finished. Well, in my, my personal experience, um, there's, there's actually a, a, a feeling or a perception of coming back into the body. It's almost as though this this attention was outside the body someplace you know it was out in the galaxy someplace and when you when you bring the attention back into your into your body uh for me there's there's actually a feeling that something is being recollected in in entering back into this 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 thing whatever we want to call it this this shell of skin um you know and you know if we go back to the course in miracles there's two sections Mm -hmm. that i think of quite often one is you know the body as a means to an end and the body as means of communication the body is totally neutral but it can be used or it can serve and so i can allow it to serve me if I use it with awareness, um, and in that awareness, then it's almost as I don't have to worry. I don't have to think about what I need to say or do because something will inform me. And it can be recognized in those feelings then. Um, Thank you, Steve. Um, these, this is the felt experience of the heart. And um, oh, that's how we learn through that felt experience. You're right, the body is neutral, but we have brought our awareness, the ever-expanding awareness that is our Christ self, the truth of our being. We've brought that awareness to the body and enlivened it. Even, and not just the body, but how we live in the world. The Course of Love says, creation 
is a dialogue to which you have not responded. What? Hmm. Well, that's like saying life is a dialogue to which we have not responded. Well, what in the world have we been doing? Hmm. But now, as we come back into our hearts, we are responding with the truth. We are remembering the truth. And that's what the language of the heart really is. It's a remembering of who we truly are. And so I, I see we've had some uh, more people join us. Welcome, Mark. And welcome, Carl. Oh. Yes, thank you for being here. <laughs> so I'm taken back to Steve's question. And it seems to me, and you kind of addressed it, Joan, about you know, this kind of come up with this idea of feeling. And, and I think I know when I'm speaking, um, when, I'm, when I'm in my mind compared to in my heart or being wholehearted, that there's a, a level of peace that I have. Yes. And I think that's... That's... Because mm -hmm. when I'm in my mind, I'm trying to, you know, prove something or impress somebody or convince somebody, and it's just like... <laughs> heart goes, give it a rest. I'm complete. Well, let's I'd like to thank you for something you said a moment ago. Something about, um, I can be myself and it's enough. That was such a gift. Um, and it, it made my heart uh, feel, go into celebration. And so, and then Joan, you were talking about how we respond to life, how we respond to in dialogue. And lately I think there's been a lot of joy and celebration in my response. A lot of saying yes. And I really do think that um, for me, the word dialogue sometimes is sort of replaced by life inviting a celebration or a banquet table. Thank you. <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, in the book Journey Without Distance, there is a uh, one of Helen's dreams is, is written uh, in it, and I don't know if you if you know the story of her dream where she she comes upon a boat next to this river that's stuck in the mud. Are you are you any, Yes, I am. Are you all familiar with that that story that that dream? And uh, you know this this stranger comes along and helps her get the boat out of the mud gets it out onto the waters, and it's very turbulent water. There's a storm. She's told, just sit in the boat, and I'll get you into safe water. And eventually, the water is made safe. It's calm water. She's going down the bank, enjoying the view of the bank, the grasses, the flowers, that sort of thing. But while they're in the middle of this storm, she points out to the boat pilot, Jesus, that there's this ancient sending and receiving unit in the back of the boat and would that help us and he says not right now you're not prepared for its use and to me it's kind of the the story of a course in miracles and a course of love coming together that in the course in miracles he gets us out into the calm water and kind of calms our mind of all the turbulence that it's acclimated itself to through all of its learning and life situations and life experiences. And once we're out under this calmer water, ACL picks up and teaches us now how to use this sending and receiving unit, which is the heart. And uh, this, this knowing then comes through this sending and receiving, this giving and receiving system that the, that the the body can be made aware of and um, you know through 
through that heartfelt experience, one comes to know instead of knowing two plus two is four. Now one can get two plus two is five. Complete. Thank you. That was so helpful. That is a wonderful um, comparison of the two courses and where they lead us. It's using that sensory device that they weren't ready for when the Course in Miracles came out. But now we're really ready to go into our hearts. So I'd like to, um, oh, do we? Okay. I'd like to take us now into this creation's call for our response, for love's response. And that's in the, uh, a reading uh, from the addendum, actually part three of the addendum of learning in the time of Christ. And this is on a page. Let's get you a page here. Oh, I've got it right here. Um, page 672 in the very back of the book. So those of you who have books and want to um, come along, <coughs> please do. Let's see. Um, and could we have a hand to read uh, or two? Um, we're going to read from A35 through A41. Is there, okay. And uh, Catherine, and then is there anyone else who would like to read? And, and Barbara, all right, and maybe one, one more, Esther? Okay, okay. So, um, Catherine, let's start off with um, paragraph A35. And how and, far would you like me to read? Uh, through A38. Okay. Through A38. Okay. Beyond the coursework of the treatises lies direct relationship, direct relationship with me. Entering the dialogue is the way that is, uh, this is expressed. Yet this is not merely about entering spoken dialogue. As was said in a treatise on the art of thought, creation is but a dialogue to which you have not responded. Creation is a dialogue. Creation is an unending act of giving and receiving as one. So too is dialogue. Listen and you will hear, but to what are you listening? Entering the dialogue is akin to residing in the present moment and to hearing all that is being spoken in all the ways it is being spoken. Now is the time to truly begin to hear my voice in every aspect of creation and to respond with your own voice in all of your own acts of creation. It is time to realize that you are a creator. Okay, thank you. So, any response to this, to this section? Well, the only response there is, how did that make you feel? <laughs> yes, yes. How did it make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, Catherine, how did that make you feel? What's oh. the feeling rather than the ideas and mind and what's just the feeling? If we Absolutely. Just bring, bring it down and feel and feel more. It just makes me feel so powerful and so excited to be a creator. Absolutely. And, to, and that I do have that wee small voice that I hadn't been listening to. And it tells me to listen to that. And that makes me smile. Yes. And it, it <laughs> made everyone smile a little bit, you know? <laughs> there is a, I, I learned something, if you, if you don't mind, I just say something very interesting. In my early days, I was uh, learning from Anthony Robbins. And I know this sounds like, far off, 
but it was one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned. And he had this little form where I had to fill up about my visual, auditory, or kinesthetic acuity. Yeah. And I, I was visual 10, I was auditory 10, but I was only too kinesthetic. Wow. And, and he said, if you are very low on kinesthetic, you're going to have to learn how to speak slowly. <laughs> and I truly took that to heart. And I began to speak slowly. And immediate result of how much more I felt when the, my mind wasn't racing like mad, trying to jam all this information, even information from the course, reading, reading, reading. When I begin to slow down and really feel every single word, I mean, this is Jesus speaking. I mean, exactly. who has the, who has the, you know, the, what do you call it? Uh, how lucky are we that we have such direct, beautiful voice speaking to us. And if we begin to connect to it, well, when we read, like when we read something real slowly, every single word manifests as an expression. Every single word manifests as feeling. And when we begin to feel those, I personally can't hardly get through one paragraph a day mm -hmm. because I read just the beginning and it drops me into this, into this unifying field that is a feeling which, which join us all. It's the, feel, it's the feeling around that connects us and we feel each other, that I feel you to your core, not just what you think you say, but what you hear, what you hear within, and also what is really deeply felt. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> Barbara. I love it. So yeah, thank, thank you, Ar thank you, Anthony Robbins. <laughs> yes. I think Barbara has something. Are you um, yes? Oh no, I well yes I do. Um when Carl was speaking about how he felt when he was reading a paragraph, um that's the beauty of uh joining with the course of love. It brings you into deep, deep feeling where you mm. can almost weep because you're hearing yes. Jesus and, and, and you're connecting and you have, you have a memory. There's a memory inside of us yes. that every once in a while, you really, really get a flash of it. And um, what else can anyone say except, wow, that is powerful, powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carl, for saying that. Thank you, thank and, you. And, and Barbara, uh, um, I think you're going to read about this intimacy that you just described in the next two paragraphs. So, 39 and 40? And 241. We'll, okay, 241. Yes. Um, this is a time of great intimacy. This is a time that is between you and I, more so than has been the coursework up to this point. It is time of realizing that I am speaking to you directly in every moment of every day, in <laughs> all that you encounter, <laughs> in all that you feel. It is a time of true revelation in which you are revealed to yourself. This is what dialogue, particularly the dialogue that is in an exchange between two or more gathered together reveals, it reveals who you are. This relationship is between the divine self and other divine self and life. Divine self and God, humanity and divinity is the dialogue of which we speak. It may seem to suggest duality, but it suggests relationship. The idea of unity and relationship must fully enter you now. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. 
you know, I'm, I'm struck with the, with the first paragraph you read where it says, this is a time of great intimacy. And of course, the paragraph's talking about an intimate relationship between us and, and Jesus. But how it concludes is something significantly different. So reading the first and last sentence, this is a time of great intim intimacy. It is a time of true revelation in which you are revealed to yourself. Mm. And now I know that Cole would ask, so how does that make you feel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Joe, how does that make you feel? <laughs> well, I mean, this whole thing is, is the mixture of feelings. It's a, it's a feeling of being overwhelmed mm -hmm. and, nice. and feeling like I've really missed out. You know. Oh, beautiful. I, I don't know if that's a feeling or a thought. That this is who I am. No, no, Joe, but that really touched, you know, that touched my heart, mm. you know? And, you know, there's one more thing I'd like to say on this feeling subject. I'm sorry to jump in, but, you know, feelings don't talk at first. I, I just use one example because this is so, such a big difference. You know how in the Course of Miracles says, ego always rushes in to establish its power there. That's in Course of Miracles. When I have clients, I say, how does it make you feel? They give me an answer in a second. And I said, no, 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 no. How does it make you feel? Then they go into this thing like, what do you mean? And then they begin to drop down. And I think there's such a thing as like, the feelings don't talk. They are feelings. Feelings feel and mind talks. Now, once we are feeling, the feeling then can be translated into thought and that enriches the communication. But the feelings themselves, they just feel, and we simply step back and let them lead the way for a while so the feeling can fully be embodied and then be, as it increases, it begins to communicate. And then the words can say, oh, and this happened and this happened. But by then I'm already feeling you. You know, I'm already feeling the other person. And to me, that is the dialogue when there is a feeling and a thought coming at the same time. That's the big distinction there. Yeah. Wait. You know, I think also in the middle of the, the paragraph where he says, it is a time of realizing that I am speaking to you. And, uh, you know, this, this taking us to the 40 days and the mountaintop experience um, is like a very subtle and gradual rising up that, yes. we're, that we're almost not... E you know, the first time I went through it, it's almost as though I wasn't even aware of that, that, that change or that, um, mm. that new knowing. And, you know, it was in the, the last chapter of the, the fourth treatise then where he says, you know, I am no longer your teacher. Uh, a change has been put in place that we begin to recognize that this I that he speaks of, this divine self, which is me, will now lead me. The time of the intermediary is over. I can, I can have a relationship with this self, which then takes me way outside of my body. It, it, it becomes spaceless. There is no limitation in it. 
Um, it emanates. It is. Yeah. Yeah. It just is. Um, then it becomes a very beautiful experience. Thank you. Thank you. And Catherine. Yes, this is such a great conversation for me. Thank you, everyone. Before I forget, Joe, I loved your slides. Um, this is a great time of intimacy and something that I am experiencing, and I don't know if others will relate to this or not, but I'm having a very difficult time spending time with people that are not intimate in their conversation that it's just all superficial like what they're going to eat or what they're going to wear or, you know the talk just about things that really don't interest me and i'm finding that what's what's happening in our group here in london ontario is that people are opening up and surprising themselves of what they consider to be deep conversations, but it's really, then they just realize that this is who I truly am. And they're becoming comfortable with who they truly are to where they're moving away from a lot of people in their lives. A lot of, one thing we do at, at each week is we check in. I do a check-in after we do our meditation and our silence. And then we do a check-in to see if there's anything that anyone has noticed that's different in their life. Like, did they respond to something differently rather than reacting to it? Or did they find somebody said something to them that they'd never said to them before? You know, like something really out of the ordinary and the feedback that we share on that level is absolutely amazing that they're understanding the change from just being in their head all the time or being in their their uh, ego or intellect or whatever we call it and just living intimately from their hearts and uh to me, it's living from my higher self, being guided by my higher self. I'm changing the words I use. I'm changing the uh, time I get up, the time I go to bed, uh, what I do with my day. It's changing everything. And sharing that with people is very intimate for me. <laughs> so I just, that really brought that up for me, Steve, when you were talking about that and, uh, Thank you for sharing that. I'm complete. Elliot. Catherine, I was just now experiencing myself listening to you with my heart's ears. Hmm. And, and that goes hand with what you were talking about, Catherine, because you're talking about uh, gathering together and doing check-ins and inviting people not only to be authentically expressing what's going on with them, but also to listen to one another with their hearts and ears. Um, I'm complete. <laughs> I, I, I'm reminded of, uh, I know there's a TED talk that, that Mari really loves and it's Brene Brown, The Power of Vulnerability. And she does this research about you know, what are the characteristics of people who live a wholehearted life? And she says, people, and she, those are her, her words. She said, people who live a wholehearted life are open and vulnerable. And like Catherine was sharing, they, they share deeply. They share from the heart. They share from experience. And what she said is, they've discovered that this is not something that's fun and easy to do. This is something that's necessary to do. They have to do that. And so I think it's not beyond exaggeration to say that what we're doing in our groups is saving lives. May not be true for women, but for men, you know, our rate of suicide is so high because men generally have a hard time finding a place where they fit in, 
having a community and 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 I really th- I, I, I don't want to say whether it's men or women but I mean I know as a man I, you know I see a lot of my friends who are just like lonely and that's just a mm. death spiral in more ways than one I'm complete yes Joe this may be a good time to transition to your um, the next slide where we invite input from everyone in terms of their suggestions for facilitating their groups and um, yeah. and expanding. We're yeah. going with the flow here. So let's uh, back to you, Joe. Yeah, I've got two more slides and you're going to have input on the second slide. So. Um, you know, we talked at the very beginning about kind of the difference between the Course of Miracles and Course of Loves, Love. And I think one of the fundamental differences is especially in the addendum, the Course of Love is explicit about groups. We have to meet together to get this stuff. We have to have a relationship. And so I've just really loved the dialogue we've had as this group so far. And... Um, let me share our slide. Um, because what we want to do is to let this gathering lead us in what we do in future gatherings and future time together. So, you know, how can we, how can our gathering be of greatest service to help you as facilitators and to help facilitators in general facilitate? So what I'd like to ask is you to think about one or two ideas that come in the form of either you know suggestions you have for things that have worked well for you as a facilitator that you might want to offer up into this gathering or questions or challenges that you face as a as a facilitator so at this point for probably the last you know 20 minutes or so we're going to just gather ideas we're just we're just gathering we're not talking about them necessarily we're gathering them and we'll talk about them in follow on groups does that make sense? I have a suggestion. Yeah. Suggestion is that um, we slow down. And when we slow down, then we slow down again. So reading slower, feeling each word, feeling, feeling and slowing down and slowing down. Okay. Good point. In my mind, uh, Christopher speaking, the single most important thing that I have yet to get through to my group is the importance of reading slowly and feeling the words. Yeah. And my group has been at it for two years, and less than they're still there. But it's, it's very, very slow, and they just don't get it. The single most important thing, to my mind, is slowing down, as Carl said, or reading slowly. And the other single most important, the second most single important thing is um, the topic that Steve raised, is how do people feel, how how can they access feelings? How can they be aware when they're talking from their feelings? That is also a major difficulty that many of my group experience. Some aren't even, even able to express their feelings. Even when I ask them to repeat an experience and tell me what the feeling was, they're not able to access any feeling at all. So I really think that Steve's question is such an important one that it should be addressed further. Carol certainly addressed and gave some marvelous insights. But I think we really need to go back and look at that and really get a handle on it. That's the end of my suggestion. Thank you. So I don't, I don't know if I've, I've been capturing ideas that have come up during our call so far and from other people. So I'm going to just keep capturing them 
So please keep sharing ideas. And I apologize, Cole, I'm still talking too fast. <laughs> yeah, no, please, you talk as, as, as much as you like <laughs> and as you do, but just be aware. And, and it was really lovely because even so you spoke fast, I could actually really feel you. And that's, I think that's also an art. I speak quite fast myself. But I, I just have one suggestion. I'm going to have to go because I'm actually at work. But I just want to come back to what was said before. I forgot the name. Hang on a second. Um, Catherine, when you were talking about the people, and this is also a good suggestion, how to run a group, because we will have people in a group who seemingly not getting it. And where they're not getting it, it brings up feelings in us. And it's, we, we need to check how does, me, how does it make me feel that someone's talk about food and insignificant things? How does it make me feel? And what am I doing with those feelings? I'm accepting those feelings or am I rejecting them in myself? Because the outer reality really just shows us where are we on a feeling level. So when this happens, like when we have groups and then somebody is doing something that seems to be nothing to do with the course or not feeling deep enough, we need to come back and say, how does this make me feel that they are doing what they're doing? And really transform that in ourselves before we come out. So that was also uh, responding to Christopher. By the way, hi, Christopher. <laughs> hi, Carl. Hey. Christopher and I know, we, we know each other for 30 years. It is lovely to see him here. So, what, so challenges, yeah. what challenges do people face? And I've already raised the issue of characters as I described yeah. them. Uh, but what are, the, what are specific challenges that people face or questions they have as facilitators? Joe, the question I would eventually like to have discussed is how groups have, uh, I want to say, like, careful of the words, but worked with the 40 days. Um, because it, 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 in the 40 days, just there, there's, there's new experiences that arise that at least for me were totally unique to any of the the reading portion of the book, if I might refer to it as that. And um, yeah, let's have a group's work the 40 days. Yeah, we'll just leave it at that for the time being. Complete. I just have a question. I'm wondering, Joe, if you might be able to distribute this list so I can look at it later. We will send out these slides. Uh, at the same time, we send out a link to the recording. So you'll, the, the PDF, uh, or at least a link to the PDF will be emailed out. Um, you know, one suggestion I have that uh, really, and, and Mark knows about this, that really helped our Zoom group, at least, and we do this even in our in-person group, is uh, rotate the role of facilitator. And that helped in, 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 again, dealing with these characters, people who go off on tangents and then tangents on tangents and, and uh, consume a lot of time. We, we rotated facility. Oh, yeah, I told said we're not going to talk about these. But anyway, that's something that really helped us. Uh, this is uh, Mark. The groups I've been involved with, I've been blessed to be involved with, have as many different personalities as the persons that I'm seeing on the on the screen now. There's, there's not been one that I've been involved with that's <clears throat> much like any other. I've enjoyed them all. But I must admit, the ones that I have enjoyed the most, and so 
this might sound a little counter to what we're doing here, but <clears throat> the ones I've enjoyed the most are those in which the facilitator disappears. Um, the group is just amorphously running itself <laughs> and most time is spent in silence. Not, not just uh, <clears throat> meditation at the beginning, but um, uh, three-fourths or more is spent mm -hmm. in silence <clears throat> with the conscious intent to become boundaryless, to become one, not just talk about it, not just read about it, but yeah. actually um, try to emulate it. I'm complete. Uh, something that's happening in my group at the moment is that uh, we make a lot of sound because that information when it arrives and when it's really felt, it's more like, oh, oh, and then we stay and we actually make so much sound, sometimes for an hour even, we can't even move to the next sentence. And we actually, it's, it's a silent, it's an inner, inner introspection, but there's a kind of like a vibration of sound that helps to reverberate feelings. Anyway, I put it out there because it sounds a little bit off, but it's actually quite amazing. You said to reverberate feelings? Yeah, we make sound. Yeah, it does rever reverberate because the feelings are basically very dense in us. I mean, the density of the body is really the density of the feelings. And so when a, when a sound is made, and I'm not saying we should make sound and do some toning or something, because it's got to be your own sound. It's my own sound. I go into, it's not even pleasant. It's, it's not very melodic. What's very interesting, particularly when I'm just with one reader there that comes, we begin to almost like a tone and just the harmony we go into together in that sound is astounding. It's so duplicated, it's so even. It's um, something new that's been happening maybe last a month or so. We just, we just sound automatically. Um, but this is happening. This is happening to us. We're not trying to sound. The sound is coming out. And in that sound comes such a much so much understanding that my mind gets illuminated through it. So the mind is not thinking, mind is being receiving something that hasn't experienced before. I'm complete. Yeah, I'd like to comment here. Uh, it is both a, a suggestion, and I face sometimes it as a challenge in the, in the group that we facilitate. I think it's important for the participants to understand that uh, a course of law is not about just the text. It's not, so we are not a reading group. It is a relationship group. Some, some participants, they are worried about reading a chapter. They want to go to the end. Mm. And sometimes I, I, I have covered the just uh, six, seven, eight paragraphs. And some people get anxious that it, it is too slow. Oh, I, well, let's read more. Let's get to the end. Let's read through the end of this chapter. And this becomes a challenge because I'm not there to read the book. Read the book, uh, we can read by ourselves. What is rich, what is unique in this Zoom gatherings, in this relationship, is exactly the, what is not in the book. It's what we bring to the dialogue. It's what we bring to the, the gathering that is really valuable. I remember Mari Peron recently talking about Zoom groups, and she mentioned exactly this. 
we don't join a Zoom meeting because it is helpful, because it is useful, it, because it is a relationship. So I think it is, this is both a suggestion. Suggestion is for us as facilitators not to worry about how much we read in one gathering. The important is the sharing. It is the deepening together. It is making our voices heard. It's the feeling, as Cole said. That is what is not in, in the text. You know? That is what we bring to the dialogue. Otherwise, it, it becomes just reading. I've been to other Zoom gatherings in which we read a lot, covered one full chapter of uh, 30 paragraphs. But in the end, you have that uh, feeling that, well, there is so much here. There is so much in just four or five of these paragraphs. And we went through 30 of them, and it became just like a reading group. So I'm complete. You know, what I captured here, and I hope hopefully you're okay with it, is had to have some discussion within the group of what the group is and is not about. You know, because I think some people in, in the groups I've been part of think that a, a group is a therapy group or a self-help group. You know, so I don't want to get into it now, but I think there's, it's value, valuable to have some discussion within the group that says, what are we and what are we not? I'm complete. Good point. And um, Rodrigo, what came to mind when I was listening to you was something about harmony and coherence. And I think those are heart experiences um, more than mind experiences. Um, I'm complete. Well, any other uh, suggestions, challenges, questions? Are we reaching the point of diminishing return on this exercise? <clears throat> I think personally, we have uh, a lot to work with her um, for our next for our next sessions over time. And, uh, and I would like to suggest that, and you'll see this in the email that comes out after this, that if you want to, you know, quote, own one of these topics for a portion of, you know, one of our calls and kind of facilitate discussion on these challenges or questions or suggestions. That would be awesome. So let us let us know how you'd like to participate, if you'd like to be a kind of a co-facilitator for one of our gatherings. I'm complete. Uh, um, we would especially like if uh, someone would start with meditations that they use, that which brings us into that energetic loving field, where we can relax and receive, be in the have open hearts, receptive hearts. So um, it, we would just email us and uh, we would love to see that experience being shared with the rest of our group, with the world, <laughs> as, it, as it turns out. So nothing exists, it is not shared. So let's continue to live through our sharing and the experiences we're having here in dialogue. So anyone else? Joan, can you can you send us the meditation you opened with? That was beautiful. Yes, uh, we have a slide of it already. And um, Joe, would you like to bring that back up a minute? Okay. Yeah, Joan wrote that. <clears throat> and again, it's um, a gift from what I call the well of spirit. And uh, th that's um, a section from the state of grace of the newly identified child of God. And if it's okay, I'd like to read that. Um, that there's a small s section to close our, the formal part of our meeting here. 
And um, so let's let's gather in our hearts again. And uh, and so um, I'm going to read this. And when I get to the prayer, a beautiful prayer, um, a gift, a gift from the well of spirit, a gift from Jesus. Open your heart for the one who dwells there in union with all will emerge, emerge from this opening. What was once a tiny pinprick of light becomes a beacon as you open your heart and allow, allow your true identity to be what is even within your form. You are in grace and union with the source and cause of unity. Be no longer causeless. You and your source are one. I'm going to read the prayer. Barbara, are you with me? And could we echo? Would you echo me? I'll read one line and then you read the same line again. Okay, all right. I am no longer the personal self who was separate and alone. I am no longer the personal self who is separate and alone. I am my Christ self. I am my Christ self. I dwell in unity. I dwell in unity. My identity is certain. My identity is certain. This is the truth. This is the truth. I am not less than I once was, but more. I am not less than I once was, but more. Where once I was empty, I now am full. Where once I was empty, I am now full. Where once I dwelt in darkness, where once I dwelt in darkness, I now dwell in light. I now dwell in light. Where once I had forgotten, where once I have forgotten, now I remember who I am. Now I remember who I am. Now I go forth to live as who I am within the world. Now I go forth to live who I am in the world. To make cause and effect as one and union with the source of love and make, all creation, the to reality. Make, to make calls as effect as one, and unity with the source of all reality. Okay. And that's the end of that beautiful prayer that touches our hearts. And now, oh, it's a call for us to walk forth walk forth in the truth of our being and all our doings in the world to live as who we are from our hearts in the love the one love that we all share thank you all thank you yeah. and i think um that ends our formal time together. If you need to leave, you can sign off. But there's also 
a little gathering afterward, the meeting after the meeting, as Joe calls it. So I'm going to end the recording. You can now say your crude jokes if you'd like.